Look who I have with me tonight. I'm very excited to be here to be part of Hot Docs. My name is Susan G. Cole. I am the entertainment and uh, books editor at Now Magazine, Now's oldest and only independent news and entertainment weekly. I'm very proud to be part of this presentation this evening and I'm really happy to say that not only do I have the filmmakers with me, but I have all four of the plaintiffs. to uh, Canada where gay marriage has been legal for a long time. <laughs> 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 We're very proud of it here and many members of this audience have been instrumental in making that happen. Let me just tell you a little bit first about how uh, this uh, panel is going to unfold. I'm going to ask a couple questions just to get things going and while I'm doing so, I really encourage you out in the audience to think of your own questions because I'm going to give you equal time because this is an evening to celebrate equality. Um, so uh, think of your questions. Um, I'll let you know when it's time to put up your hand and get the attention of three people who are roaming around here with microphones and uh, really looking forward to what you have to say and to getting a really great conversation going. I am, however, going to start, uh, if you guys don't mind, with the filmmakers, uh, Ryan, Ben. Uh, you can argue among yourselves as to who's going to answer this question first, but I'm just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about, uh, about the collaboration. Whose idea was this? Did you come at it together? I know you're not together, <laughs> for a fact. Did you come at it together? Did you, when did you get interested in the project and how did it come about? Um, so, Ryan and I actually met at Sundance five years ago, uh, and that was about three months before we found out that this case was going to be filed. Uh, we were lucky enough to know some of the people at the American Foundation for Equal Rights who were going to file the case, and they told us that they were looking for plaintiffs and that this was coming up. So, um, so I called Ryan and I said, hey, what about the idea of uh, working together on this documentary? And Ryan, who cares a lot about the issue too, was like, yeah, this is a it sounds like fun. You know, at the time we had no idea that it would turn into the case that it did. I think we just thought, you know, this is a really interesting story of a conservative and a liberal lawyer coming together. These guys sound like they're kind of interesting and smart, so let's follow them around a little bit. Uh, and then we got to meet uh, Chris and Sandy and Paul and Jeff, and uh, they're like, okay, well, let's, let's just stick this out and see where it goes. And, and then the judge decided that there would be a trial, and, uh, and that was kind of, the rest was history. And we, we shot the movie for probably three years without knowing that there was a movie. Um, we were kind of shooting because we were fascinated by it, we liked the characters, but there was going to be no movie if there was no ending to the movie. So we, we shot 600 hours of footage and spent three years shooting, kind of hoping that it would become something, that it would snowball into something bigger as, as, as filmmakers and as storytellers and as gay Californians. For all those reasons, we wanted it to become something bigger. Um, and luckily it did, and so once the Supreme Court took the case, Ben and I knew that we had a third act for our film and that we needed to set it in motion. And if we could just point out one person in the audience who really set that in motion is our editor, Kate Amend, if she doesn't mind standing up. Who is the 
most incredible editor in the world, and we hired Kate, so we shot 600 hours of footage in a, a little bit over four years, and we hired Kate in May of last year uh, to edit the film by November of last year. So it was six months to edit a film that takes 600 hours and whittle it down to 112 minutes, which if anyone in here is a documentary editor or director, you know that's a turbocharged schedule. And so it's a credit to her and the entire team that worked for Kate that they uh, pulled this off, and we're so grateful because she deserves so much credit for the final product. Can I ask you how much of a setback was it that cameras weren't allowed into the courtroom in the first uh, for the first leg of this trial? It's always you know pretty interesting to see that kind of stuff. But was that a bit of a setback, or were you okay with it? it we were, it is a setback and we were okay with it because had cameras been allowed in the courtroom, first of all, you never assume that cameras are going to be allowed into a courtroom in the U.S. Most trials aren't filmed. So we never were banking on the fact that a trial would be filmed. Um, but when Judge Walker raised that as a possibility, there was sort of some excitement, sort of bittersweet excitement on our parts. And I think um, had cameras been allowed in the courtroom, any filmmaker could have made this film, right? They would have had access to all the footage, and someone could have put out a film much faster than we could have about the trial itself. And so when the cameras were blocked and there was no transmission of the footage, it was a challenge for us as, as storytellers on how to retell that story, but it also gave us the sort of unique access monopoly on, on this case because we had all the behind the scenes footage. So I actually think in the end Ben and I both agree that it made our film a better film because we were presented with the challenge along with Kate of uh, it then became a, a, a film about behind the scenes and pulling back the curtain of what goes into a trial rather than what's necessarily happening in the trial. Um, do you, I, you agree with that? Yeah, plus the cameras that they decided to use in the courtroom that actually recorded were really crappy. So. Yeah. <laughs> but, and then you, but that meant also that you staged those sequences in which people were reading from the transcripts. Right? Which was kind of a fluke, and Ryan deserves all the credit for. We were doing interviews with, uh, with, with Ted and with these guys, and we were like, okay, it, it, Ryan had the idea of maybe we'll have them read some of the transcripts since we don't have that footage of them, and that was really for us the most powerful part of the trial. Uh, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, so um, we, we hated the idea of that not being seen in any way by anyone. So Ryan said, why not, if we have a little bit of extra time at the end of the interview, we have them read these and we'll just see them. And it was kind of just a shot in the dark. Uh, and little did we know that these guys were really good actors. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the emotion came through. And I don't, I'm curious to hear what they think, because we were just talking about this the other day, that, you know, I think those interviews were filmed about three years after the trial. So I think it had been a while since you guys had looked at those transcripts and processed those emotions. So I think that might have been part of the reason why those emotions came through in those interviews. I don't know if any of you felt that way. I've always been, I'm always moved every time I hear Chris and Sandy's testimony. I think when they, when Chris talks about living life on a higher arc and kids not having to know, if they grew up in Bakersfield not knowing what this, this felt like. And then when Sandy talks about them being big, strong women and that, you know, that they'll survive this, but if other people can benefit it from more life, profound and life-changing ways. I mean, that just, it tears at my heart sitting in the seat listening to that. It's just so eloquent. And I didn't really mean to say big. <laughs> I want to. I want. I want to turn the, uh, turn my attention to the to the plaintiffs and, and talk to you, uh, Chris and Sandy. Oh, here's our guy. Oh, thank you. Um, it's a very personal film in a way. There's a lot of personal information, so I, I hope you don't mind if I ask you a personal question, which is, you. you you, you went through this incredible experience. Um, you had been married, you had been together for a while, you blended families, you're raising kids, which I know is huge. But was there something about this experience that was a discovery for you as far as who each of you was? What did you find out about each other through this process? No, you, you do it. <laughs> oh, uh... I think we became so very clear on um, what not having access to marriage had really been like for us. I mean, before we got involved in the case, we 
you know, we, we, you saw the footage of our wedding. We had gotten married in 2004, and we got married at City Hall. That, that was the one that was taken away. And you go through those things, and they're really, they're, you know, the wedding was fantastic. The taking away was awful. Um, and then you just, but it's, the next day it's Monday, and you go to work, and it's Tuesday, and you do laundry, and it's Wednesday, you've got soccer practice, and you're busy, busy, busy. And we just didn't really allow ourselves the luxury of thinking that much about the harm that was being done to us. Um, being involved in the case just brought it home. And we became so intensely um, and painfully aware through our deposition prep, our trial prep, um, the reactions sometimes of family and friends to what we were embarking on. Uh, and it, it just kind of crystallized some of the injustices and the difficult um, situations that you're in and how, how hard it is. And to, it made us look at it in a way that we didn't normally look at it. And that was probably the hardest part of the whole experience. I, um, I, I was, it was a pretty cathartic, almost therapeutic experience for me, which I, you know, is really personal. <laughs> but um, I had gotten so dissociated from the discrimination and all of the, the layers of, you know, callous. You put around your heart and your head and you put your head down and you keep doing things. And the only way to be an effective plaintiff um, was to stop being dissociated. Uh, which is really hard work, and I, you know, really g g glad that the lawyers were also sort of psychologically sophisticated enough to move us through a process that was slow, but, you know, but also not slow. And I think what you see on the screen is the layers being pulled back and sort of the, the sort of inner part of my psyche screaming out, you know, I can't take it anymore. Um, and I'll tell the judge this now that I've been, you know, put through a process. and. And I really, I really feel grateful that the process led me to my own sort of, you know, core. And I, I kind of hope that if you watch it, you feel that you can find yours too, and that people that don't ever meet us um, are helped by that law going away and can never have to build up that much callus um, because it's just exhausting. Um, and I would really rather just be happy. You know? <laughs> commit ourselves to, as you put it, raising the bar. And I'm just totally for that. Jeff um, and, and Paul, what did you learn about, well, I, I was curious about what you learned about the other, not only about yourself, but what did you discover about your partners in this? <laughs> or yourselves. Okay, I'll take it back. No, all right, I'll, if that's too hard, you can just talk about what you can either be really good or really bad. <laughs> just to echo what I think Chris is saying, it's, it's, everyone dreams of their wedding day. And we as gay and lesbians have to fight for our wedding day. And so what I learned, I think, about us was how much, exactly what Chris and Sandy said about the desire about the weakness in our relationship of not really mining deep enough to talk about the damage that we felt on a daily basis, which kept us from being 100% each other for each other and ourselves in the relationship. Um, what I will say is, what I learned about this for myself and I think about Jeff was how much I do matters. Because we lived our lives together, I mean eight years when the case started, and 12 when we got married. And I thought I knew everything about Jeff. I thought I knew everything about our relationship. I thought I knew the depth of love, you know, what commitment was about, what it feels to know about the, you know, meeting the person that's always going to be there for you, that you always want to be there for. And what I learned about Jeff was that he's stronger than I ever thought. He's smarter than I ever thought. I love him deeper than I ever thought I could. And those things are human. They're universal. They're not gay. Not lesbian. They're not left. They're not right. They're just human. And we were being held back from feeling those feelings, the depth of our love, the responsibility of having rights that we wanted and deserved. And the moment that we got to say, I do, we just deepened our love. We broadened our horizons. And I think that's what I learned most about this in this process. Go. <laughs> uh, 
I think what, we, what I learned about Paul, and, and the same thing about our relationship, but we we'll learned about uh, through Chris and Sandy as well, is that sometimes, sometimes you have to say yes to something to say no to something. <laughs> and that really comes back to the genesis of being involved in the case and, and our decision to say yes in order to say no. We weren't going to take it anymore. And um, we went through a, a, a process uh, quite cathartic for Paul and I when, when we first decided to do it. Uh, because we lived in Los Angeles, we lived. Uh, he worked in West Hollywood, and we got a lot of backlash when when the case was first filed, and we had a lot of, you know, you, if you, what if you lose? You could set the movement back ten years, and you know, we were called troublemakers. Uh, but I think we learned uh, through that process that the resolve that we had as individuals, and it had nothing to do with with being gay and lesbian. It was just. The fact that we were tired of being treated that way, and whether we won or lost, we still knew that at the end of the day, at least we did something. At least we tried. Um, and th th there's critics out there that certainly have a lot to say, but don't do anything about it. And we decided to to do something about it. And, and I jokingly said to Paul one day, "Well, at least." You know, they can put on our tombstone, we didn't stand for being treated second class, win or lose. So, I think I just learned that we were, we were stronger than we ever thought we could be. Now, now after the trial, I asked both couples this. Um, was it a relief? What, obviously, winning is good. But, uh, when you went back, did you go back to a so-called normal life? And did you kind of miss the rush of what had been going on with you, or were you just really happy it was over? I see you all going, thank God it was over. Right? But, uh, what they say. <laughs> <laughs> I, I jokingly put, uh, you know, we came back and the ruling was on a Wednesday, and I took Thursday off to decompress, and I, my Facebook status literally said, today I'm mowing the lawn. <laughs> and that's really what it was. So, you know, all four of us have jobs, all four of us has, have mortgages. So, we don't have kids, but they have kids to put through college, so we have to go to work. Um, so we would plug in when we needed to plug in, and we would unplug uh, when we had the opportunity to unplug. Um, I don't miss the waiting, I don't miss the anxiety, because at the end of the day, it was really about getting the ring, and I've got the ring now. <laughs> I don't miss the benches. Um, can you imagine going to church for eight hours a day for 13 days in a row? <laughs> it doesn't feel... It doesn't feel good. I don't, I don't miss looking up and forgetting Ben or Ryan are there and then remembering they're there and thinking, oh, what did I just say? What just happened? Um, so there's no, I don't think there's any going back to the people we were at the beginning of this. And I, and I, and part of me wishes I could go back and part of me is so glad I am not going back. So it's, it's a weird time. I think we're still in a transition to our new life, and we don't know, we're not there yet. We're really all a bunch of newlyweds, like children. <laughs> I went back to work that Thursday morning after the ruling. We flew back from Washington, D.C. We went to L.A. We had a rally, and thousands of people. We went and had cocktails. I think one of the trees was holding me up at the end. Right about 1 a.m., I was like, I gotta go. <laughs> and I think we got up around 7. Jeff had the day off. He's like, I'm gonna mow the lawn. I said, I'm gonna go to work, and I walked into work, and everyone went, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm leaving that. No, I didn't leave. But that was, I, the idea was, and Jeff mentioned it, I think that's the important thing, because everyone goes, wow, your lives must have changed so much, and you do so. And it's, and it's, it's such a great thing to know that Jeff and I, and Chris and Sandy, have just we went back to our everyday lives, every day. And we'll go back this week and go right back to work. <laughs> Let me change the subject and talk about the actual case. Um, I just wanted to ask this question to you, and any one of you can answer it, because... <coughs> Um, after seeing the movie, I've seen it a couple of times, and, and, being, and being, watching the six uh, witnesses for um, the proponents of property drop out, and watching William Tam get creamed, and David Blankenhorn, uh, Thorne, I was waiting for him to come out, for heaven's sake. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but not really. It, 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 it was... <laughs> Who knew, you know, uh, what was what was going to happen? And, 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 but one of the 
things that astonished me about the case, and um, I know the lawyers aren't here, but I'm hoping you can comment. And I want, I'm, I'm hoping you can comment on the basis of how you were feeling at the time, but it struck me that the case for Prop 8 was unbelievably weak. And, um, of course, we know, watching the movie, how it was going to end. But while you were in the courtroom, while you were filming it, guys, did you not go, like, what the hell? These guys are not prepared. Am I, am I right? It was weak, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm not just saying, talking ideologically, even. No, because even saying. ideologically wrong people can come up with good legal arguments. They were prepared. No, they were prepared. It was a serious attempt to win. The thing that was hard for them was they were trying to take a political campaign and make it into a legal case. And they were stumbling around at times trying to figure out which fact they were proving and which slogan they were saying again. And you could see there was just so many, there was a lot of confusion inside that camp because it was being basically the legal team was made up of the political people. And they weren't necessarily the experts we had because we were relying on experts and evidence. And they were relying on political people. So, you know, it's technically not a fair fight in a courtroom. And the way it felt, honestly, at times was, frankly, humiliating uh, to have to be in the presence of people with that much hatred toward you, who are willing to stand up, take an oath, and talk about how wrong you are in front of your children. It is awful. And then there were other days where our side was just soaring. Like, the evidence was just perfect and the testimony was so moving and the judge was so li listening so intently that you thought it's you know it tr it, it, the trade-offs were daily or sometimes hourly and I, I it was really a privilege i felt like oh I, this is a privilege to be here so many people would, would learn so much else to be here and that's why the film is is the the, the time capsule frankly, of this effort, because there's no other record. And, and so every time I see it, I'm just grateful that we were there and we have this record. I think the, um, one of the scenes that we weren't able to include in the film that I think we both really liked, there was a scene where um, it, it was actually a surprise that this case even went to trial. They actually, from the outset, thought, Ted and David both thought that the judge would decide on the, the merits of the law and this and that, and it would be appealed immediately, and that they wouldn't need to call experts, and they wouldn't need, these guys didn't think that they were going to ever testify when they first signed up for this. What a surprise. <laughs> um, and so we, it, it was really the judge that said, you know, these issues have never been presented before a court with experts to actually argue what the facts in this case are. And I think it was a surprise to both sides that the judge asked for that, but it ended up being, uh, I, I think, one of the most monumental parts of the trial was that he said, you know, this is a, we're a rational society where we debate these things in a very, um, you know, uh, in a very rational way. Let's, let's actually, like, let's see what the experts have to say. And, and that's when, uh, you know, everybody said, oh, like, yeah, like, if you actually put this stuff under a microscope, like, their argument is really weak. Um, and that's, I think, the, that changed the course of the entire case. Um, just for the audience sake, I'm, I'm going to ask one more question to the panel. And um, so what I would like you to do is, if you want to ask a question, um, just to prepare uh, the people with the microphones here, if you could... Just put up your hand in such a way to, to gesture that you want to make a comment. I actually don't mind if you make a comment. Usually I don't like that, but if you want to <laughs> say how great the film was and how wonderful these amazing people are, go right ahead. But if you have a question or a comment, please put up your hand and I will, um, after I ask this one more question, uh, uh, come to the audience to, um, to hear what you have to say. Um, I'm going to ask the question to Ryan, and we were talking about it outside, so I, you know what I'm going to ask you, which is about the fact that you could have included a lot more Hollywood in this movie, especially the great Lance Black, who is the screenplay writer for Milk, and uh, old meathead uh, Rob Reiner, who, who knew, right, meathead would become so important to the gay movement. But, you made that choice not to. Can you talk a little bit about why you made that choice? Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a, a constant conversation, I'd say, in the editing room, trying to figure out that balance, because that was the board of the foundation. I don't know if everyone realized that. It includes Rob Reiner, his wife, Michelle, Bruce Cohen, who's a big Hollywood producer that produced American Beauty and 
Silver Linings Playbook, Lance, who wrote Milk and won an Oscar for it, Ken Melman, who's the former RNC chairman, um, John Lewis, who's the, the president or the head of Progressive Insurance. So they're all big, huge personalities and very big in the Hollywood world. Uh, and they deserve a lot of credit. They were the board behind this lawsuit, so you don't want to discredit them and make a film where you don't feel like they're each getting a moment that they deserve. On the flip side, once we started editing the film, I mean, the real hook when Ben and I joined the film was the Ted David Odd Couple thing, right? That's what drew the press in, that's what drew us in as filmmakers, but then we began following these four um, throughout the course of so many years, and it became very clear that they were the heart of the film to us as filmmakers. And so, you know, their regular lives, their family's lives were the heart of the film. And so, uh, it becomes difficult to find a balance because once you start including big celebrities, especially big gay celebrities, then you're waiting for the next time that they're going to appear, um, you know, and it's sort of a, a struggle. And so, what we tried to do with Ben and I and Kate was, uh, you know, each board member I think has a moment in the film where, where they where they're you know, they have a sound bite, they have a moment. Um, but we didn't want it to distract from the everyday lives of LGBT, LGBT people in the U.S., so that was sort of a constant conversation for us. Good call. I see there's a question up there. Uh, okay, so my question for you is, first of all, congratulations, thank you so much. I'm an American who moved here because I couldn't stay with my partner. Um, but anyway, that's besides the point. I'm wondering, as a, docu as a person who's made a documentary, what it's been like for you. I mean, it was enough that you went before the press, before the courts, you know, all these, this is for the newlyweds. Um, <laughs> that, and I'm wondering how having this all mediated by a documentary filmmaker has really changed or not changed or what it's done for you in your relationship, I, I don't know how to, I'm not sure exactly how to ask what I think way it changed you, but did it change you at all to have someone following you around? <laughs> well, we hid from them for the first month or two, to be honest. <laughs> I see them coming in, I think, oh, oh, I don't know, what are they doing and what's with the cameras? Um, we, we developed over time such a trusting relationship, we, they, and they became such common fixtures in, you know, in all these different experiences. Um, to the point where we would tease them and say, you're like having more children in our house, you know. <laughs> we call Ryan our brown-eyed son because he eats a lot and needs rides to bark, which is a subway. So, um, when you develop that relationship, it, it becomes so uh, comfortable and we have such a high degree of faith that they um, wouldn't include anything in the film that would embarrass us or that would be upset by, and they were wonderful about that and really honored our requests, and sometimes we'd say something and say, don't put that in all, you know, whatever, I, this crazy thing I just said is definitely not for public consumption. Um, for, I think, I speak probably for all of us, we consider the film to be a great gift to us, you know, just little old us, we would never get to uh, look back and see it as vividly as we can now through the, through the film and through the eyes of the filmmakers. So it's, it's wonderful, if it's changed my life, it's been positive, and I'm really happy to get to have this too. To watch, and I'm, you know, I'm slowly, I'm slipping, you know, so I'm getting kind of old, and who knows how long I can remember. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would echo what Sandy said. I, it is a gift, and it's a privilege, and I think um, I can't wait for so many people to see this film, and it's not because we're in it, <laughs> um, because. There's no ego about this. In fact, it's 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 weird in a good way, um, but because I think it's going to move people. I think it's going to take the people that were in the middle that said you're wrong about this, and we're not going to say it, the the movie doesn't punch you in the face and say no you're wrong. It says step into our shoes for a few years. Take a look at what we had to do because of what I said earlier. Because we. Being married to Jeff doesn't change the institution of marriage. It doesn't harm any child anywhere. And that's the message that we hear over and over and over and over again. And I think this film does a very powerful job. Um, Kate and Ben and Ryan did an amazing job of saying, we're not going to take an angle to make people feel right or wrong. We're going to tell a human story. And that changes people's lives. It changes their hearts and their minds. We know we could rely on the law. The law is black and white. We demand it because we're Americans. You have it because you're Canadians. <laughs> we wanted to be like you. 
Um, but we had to demand that and we'll lean on the law because it's black and white and the law should protect us. But there's also the court of public opinion. It's very important because it also defines the safety of kids growing up in our country. It defines our association with our community and global language that helps us when we check into a hotel and say, yes, it's a king bed because this is my husband. It makes it definitive and it's important and I'm very happy that they were there to make it happen. Ben and I have talked about it in other Q&As too, you know, statistics show, I don't know if this is an American thing or a worldwide thing, but I'm assuming it's a worldwide thing, if someone has someone in their family that's gay or someone knows someone that's close to them that's gay, they're much more likely to support equal rights, right? And so we thought, wow, we have this rare opportunity here to, you know, Ted Olson is our lead character. Conservatives are going to see this film. We're trying to get this film in as many red states as possible. Religious groups, conservative groups, you know, all over the country. We have this rare opportunity where we can have two hours with an audience, and they can get to know four gay people. You know, whether they don't know these people personally in, the, in their lives, they can get to know these people, and they can leave the film feeling like, you know, and I, if we achieve anything, that's what I hope we achieve, that our audience feels like they, they know these four people at the end of the film, and it sort of dares the audience not to be happy for them when you watch that final scene of the film. And we haven't met, I don't know if there's anyone here, we haven't met anyone yet at a, at a screening. You know, we probably played eight film festivals, so maybe 30 screenings that stood up. And, and, and objected with the ending of the film. And so I think that's why we're so grateful to them for putting their lives out like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. Oh, hello. Great friend, Fox. Hello. Um, sometimes you ask the question that you're afraid of the answer, and this is one of those questions. Um, in Canada, and I think around the world, most of the opposition to gay rights is religious-based. Um, and the documentary does a really good job of giving the religious crazies the microphone because the more that they're portrayed, the more it moves the moderate and middle part of the public towards us. But we saw nothing in the documentary about religious support. And wasn't that stark in your case that the religious voice was so overwhelmingly negative and very little support? Uh, um, Reverend Hawks, you are asking about whether in fact they had religious support? Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, so let me start someplace else for just a second. The other side was funded through the Mormon Church and the Catholic Church. That's how they won that race, by four percentage points at the ballot box. Only funded from money, really, primarily outside of California. So it was, in a sense, a religious group making state policy, right? But we have, a, we have this thing called the separation of church and state. So we ended up in court on some level against a couple of churches. So, in terms of just now back to just anyone up here, I don't know, but I will wager to say there was not a, a visible faith community effort to support us. But I will also say I didn't see a lot of opposition either during the trial, during the court proceeding. So, in some sense, I guess the religious community didn't keep vocalizing. Um, their opinion, good or bad, um, during that very long process. Now, you may have access to information behind the scenes, but I just want to say it's like someone who picked up the paper every morning and of course would go on Facebook and look at what was going around it was surprisingly quiet from the faith community. Um, and I think to Ryan's point about hopefully the audience for the film <coughs> will be the people who either felt they needed to make a contribution against us who could move more to the center, or people who are undecided or unclear on who, what this is, so they can start to not be against it. You know, that's actually a victory. Just not being against us is a victory. Um, it's I not know setting the bar a little low. It is low, but I'll take it. You know, but I, you know, I think your leadership here and the the bravery you've demonstrated is. I wish we had more faith leaders like you in the U.S. I think it would really help a lot. Uh, I think there's a question. I, I can't see you. I'm so sorry, but there you are. I'm, I'm here, even if you can't see me. Um, first of all, wonderful job. Uh, this is with regards to the plaintiffs. The four of you are obviously very likable. I mean, you're, you're the perfect plaintiffs. Um, and I'm a lawyer, so that's I'm saying that. And, uh, but. Um, but I would like to know a little more about the plaintiff selection process in the film, because we didn't get that much of that, and, and what that was like for you, and maybe how many other potential plaintiffs there were. 
That's it. Uh, well, Paul and I were, we, we weren't really looking to do something like this. We were uh, not even politically active other than just making sure that we were informed voters and educating our friends on, on what Prop 8 was. Uh, did you we, apply? I no, guess that we, the, uh, how did that, no, seriously, we don't, that, okay, I think there's okay, a question. I'll, is yeah, I'll go into the, I'll, I'll tell the Cliff Note version. It's a, it's a rather lengthy story. I, uh, the National Organization for Marriage is, a, is an anti-gay organization in America. Uh, at the time, was led by a woman by the name of Maggie Gallagher. And uh, she and her organization put out an ad called The Gathering Storm. And it played around social media, and it was played after the campaign about what, what would happen in America if, if gays and lesbians were allowed to marry. And it was depicted with by actors with storm clouds and thunder and lightning and all these terrible things and it was just filled with lies and misrepresentations and um, I had seen it and it, it, I was infuriated but I knew um, I knew that if I showed it to Paul it would just it would send him over the edge and sure enough it did uh, <laughs> and we ended up from you know, really just from more of a cathartic re uh, reason we sh decided we were going to shoot a response to that and we called it weathering the storm and we didn't use actors we we reached out to family and friends and we put together um, uh, uh, a coalition of people that included um, religious based organizations as well because we thought that was a very important part of the story to tell and um, it got uh, over the course of a couple of days it had about 150,000 views on, on YouTube and CNN had called and wanted to interview Paul and. Um, somehow, someone that was in that video um, just happened to go to Chad Griffin's house for a gathering that weekend and uh, told them what they had done and Chad said, well, who are these guys and are they married? And um, we got a phone call to, uh, by Christina Shockey, uh, who comes off incredibly lovely in the film. Um, that shot when she's watching us go out the steps for the first time, it's like a school teacher watching the kids in the, in the classroom. Um, but, so we go down to a law firm in Los Angeles and we were supposed to talk about the next steps in this educational campaign to uh, get rid of Prop 8 somehow. And when we got to the law firm, they came clean and said, this is, this is what we're looking to do, would you be interested? Um, and we did, we, we, we expressed a level of interest and um, like Christina said, there was a vetting process. So we didn't apply, we were approached uh, as I think Chris and Sandy were approached as well. Yeah, um, I had worked with Chad and Rob Reiner on early childhood education advocacy in California for a number of years. Never one time ever talked about LGBT rights or even, frankly, the fact that I was a lesbian. It was just, I worked with them on a totally different issue. And so, periodically, on random days, I would have a conversation with Chad on early childhood education in California, and on a day like that, he was in the middle of this process. And I, he was just... He just said, now, did you and Sandy get married? And I said, no, we couldn't do it again. It came and went, it's too much. He goes, can you hold, please? <laughs> <laughs> rest is history. <laughs> I have another question over here. Hi. So you spent four years going through this battle, and you had um, a couple court decisions that said the Prop 8 was unconstitutional. And then you get to the Supreme Court, and it looks like from the end of the film that the Supreme Court's decision is not that it's a uh, property is unconstitutional. It looks like it was made on the legal technicality of standing that, that these people aren't the right people to fight this law. How did that feel? It, 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 that decision that it, they weren't, it's, it looks like they didn't actually decide the property was unconstitutional. They kind of wiggled around it through a technicality. Well, I, w I would say that was hard, actually, because we, um, you know, we got all the way there to the Supreme Court, and we really felt like, for us, for me, the respectful <coughs> thing to do for the justices would be to look at the merits of the case and, and take a brave stand and look at the real issue. Um, and there was a lot of controversy around that. A lot of people saying that the court wouldn't feel like the country was ready for a 50-state ruling, which is what that could be. Um, so it, it was hard to have them not look at that because we have this amassed this fantastic body of evidence, and you know what better time to look to take that evidence and, and 
rule on it. Um, but the fact that they remanded it back to the original ruling, which was a sweeping victory in California, we had a sweeping victory, was itself still a victory for us. Um, it just didn't get to the 50 states. Um, but, you know, our victory, or, you know, which we consider to be a victory, even though they, you know, it was on standing. It was the same day as DOMA. And to have on one day, Marriage in California, which is one-fifth of the country, uh, one-eighth or so, um, <laughs> lots of people. <laughs> but to have that on the same day as DOMA, where the federal government would recognize any marriage in the country, that was a... A fantastic vict victorious day for all of us. Stop it, Paul. <laughs> See, I'm the mother. Knock him off. Really? <laughs> but keep in mind too now that in the United States there are currently only two states that do not have either a federal or state challenge to a marriage equality law, and those states would be North Dakota and Alaska, and they're coming soon. And a lot of those cases cite uh, the Windsor case that was decided at the Supreme Court and a lot of the Perry case as well. So uh, while we might not have gotten our decision, uh, 50 state ruling last June, that 50 state ruling is, is coming and it's coming soon. And, and there were only two states where marriage was legal when this case began. When Prop 8 passed, marriage was only legal in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And so you can see the watershed right there and what happened during the time period of this case where now it's illegal in 33 states. So it's legal now in 17 states. We jumped 15 states since the Perry case took place. And, and that graphic where you see the change is very Public powerful. Opinion. And yeah. it's interesting too to me that the frame for the film to me was Obama winning and opposing gay marriage. And then, and you know, don't you love the fact it was Obama's kids who said, my friends have lesbian parents, you know, and that's what changed everything. I love that. So, but what? Oh my God! <laughs> changed everything. Unfortunately, we have room for just one last question, and it's coming from somebody up there. Hi. Um, just as a young person, I just wanted to say thank you so much for putting out this film, um, and to the four of you for inspiring the younger generation. Um, I wish more young people were here to experience what I just experienced. It was wonderful. Um, I was just wondering. Um, for the four uh, plaintiffs, if you could just say maybe one trait that you really felt helped you through the whole process, or something that within yourself really allowed you to go through the, the process that you went through. <laughs> Great, now I get to start. I, I, well, this is probably good because I can't filter it. Um, it's not even a trait, it's just truth. Um, I have learned to live my truth. And I grew up in San Francisco, where you would think that I would be surrounded by gay people and it would be totally accepted, but I was bullied and I was also harassed and um, in my own nuclear family. When this case came out, uh, my brother and I haven't spoken for almost four and a half years. And up until that point, he was fine with Jeff and I being a couple, as long as we were in a bubble and we were not in the public. As soon as we went public, it changed everything. And the old Paul, would feel guilty about that. The old Paul would feel like I, I had done something wrong, like it was my fault and that being gay was bringing this shame to the family, as he called it. And because of the case and because of the support, because of the people that we were surrounded with, I actually learned to, learn to live my truth. And I live my truth every single day. So every day when I hit the pillow, I know I've done two things. I've not gone to bed angry, because that's Jeff and, and, my, and our rule, that's our rule, never go to bed angry. So when you get in a relationship, that's a good rule to have. <laughs> and the second thing is, I go to bed and I ask myself, did I live my truth today? And if I can say yes, I can go to bed and I can get a good night's sleep. Chris? <laughs> uh, I love thinking about people having a better life and never knowing who they are. And just this sense of spreading good, you know, just radiating good from this instead of that is, I just take so much joy and satisfaction in thinking of the people we'll never meet that may not even be born yet, 
that'll grow up in California with a different sense of their potential and their future. It's great. I don't know if this is a, a, I would say perseverance because one of, I've always told Paul that one of my biggest regrets is I didn't come out of the closet to my family and friends until I was 30. And we got involved in this case when I was 35. So I think I had been so private about who I was and then I came out really and then ultimately came out in such a public way. <laughs> Don't do things you know, in a small way. That I just think that, I mean, I just think that the perseverance and I was able to persevere over that regret and, and, and ultimately you know, feel so much more comfortable in my own skin than I ever have. Um, well, these are all such fantastic things, and I agree with all of those, <laughs> certainly. I would say that uh, one thing, <laughs> except going to bed angry, which I do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> important uh, or that I realized about myself is how much compassion I was able to feel and it, for certainly for, for us in our own shoes for I felt an amazing appreciation and compassion for the expert witnesses who got up there and talked about the research they've done for 20 30 years it's been largely unnoticed by the legal system about how discrimination hurts also great compassion for the people on the other side um, I felt compassion for Blank and Horn I feel compassion for him when I'm watching this film and I see that he he says what's true for him, that he did change, and he doesn't do it in the most graceful way, but good for him, you know? Um, it's not easy. I felt compassion for the justices. They really struggled with the issue. The Supreme Court was not divided along the lines you would typically see. They had a really, a really different division for different reasons. Um, and I felt compassion for one of the other witnesses who almost cried when he got, you know, cross-examined by David Boyce, because that's like worst day in your life. <laughs> Uh, I felt compassion for people who were on our side, who worked on my, our side, and even when I, like, talking to my own mother, who was a sweet, sweet little old lady in Iowa, she's a, she's a, you know, uh, died in the wool Catholic and a farm wife, and um, it was hard for her, and, and I asked her once, I, she, she said, you don't think you'll be in the newspaper, do you? <laughs> I said, you know, Mom, I, I think, I think so. I'm like, we're on the Catholic Messenger in your house, on the front page, clearly we're going to be in the papers. Um, but I said, I, I, I said, are you embarrassed about, about me being in this? And she said, you know, I'm sorry to say that I, I am, but I, I feel bad in saying that. And I said, you know, Mom, I, I understand. It's, it's hard. It's hard to... Um, have me be involved in this with, and I, I get it, it's really different from your life, but I want to talk to you about how maybe we could take you from feeling embarrassed to feeling proud and I think it's possible for you to, for you to feel proud about this um, and it helped our relationship evolve and she, she's, she's gotten there reasonably well, or she's on her journey at least, um, you know and, uh, but I, I really felt uh, like it opened my eyes to uh, you know, to see a lot more gray and less black and white, and I no longer think Republicans are awful, necessarily. <laughs> Often, but not always. <laughs> That's what I learned about myself. <laughs> appreciation uh, to Hot Docs for programming the film, for bringing the two filmmakers to visit with us and these incredibly brave uh, uh, couples who have really made history uh, in, in such a profound and spectacular way. Thank you very much to all. Thank you all. And good evening.